why BC stream keepers want to keep bugs in our water. The Capilano River ecosystem and Cleveland Dam. And why the GVRD is performing muscle autopsies. Welcome to the Sustainable Region, I'm Kulti Kayla. What an awesome day for a walk and what better place than the Capilano River and the GVRD's Capilano River Park. It was created back in 1926 and is one of the oldest and most visited parks in the entire Lower Mainland. The park starts from here in the Burrard Inlet and goes all the way up to the Cleveland Dam. And along the way, you're gonna find some great hiking trails. The Cleveland Dam was one of the region's first major construction projects. And up next, we're going to meet Frank Hunt, who began working on the dam with the Greater Vancouver Water District. He's been with the GVRD since it was first formed in 1966. Frank is also an amateur historian and has his own mini museum. I wanted to work for the Water District in the worst way, mainly because uh, I had a, a grandfather, a relative working in the water district. Their, well, their head office at the time was over on 10th Avenue and Point Grey, and I would go over there once a week for about three years, once a week, and bug them until they got sick of seeing me. And uh, little did I know that uh, history was gonna be a big part of this job. This has got a couple of good pictures here of the uh, turn of the century, them laying the first water mains uh, out of the watersheds. Now this is Seymour, but the same principle applied to Capilano. They would have a, a portable sawmill and then a donkey, donkeys or horses would skid it to wherever they were working. They would fall fir trees, use the mill, mill it all into boards, for the to make the pipe with. As the elevation dropped and the pressure started to increase in this wood pipe, they knew at what point the pressure would blow that pipe apart. So as they worked down to the, the broad inlet from the source, they had to start adapting the wood to steel, riveted steel pipe that would withstand maybe a hundred pounds pressure more than was in the pipe. What I've got in my hand here is a, it's, it's a wood, it's, it, well I've written on here, wood stave pipe caulking tool. Cedar swells up five times its size when it's wet. So they would cut all different size wedges. They'd go along the pipe and wherever the water sprayed out, one guy would feed the cedar in and the other guy would caulk the cedar Sometimes they use something called oakum. It was like a horse's hair and oil mixed together. And you'd put that in steel pipes a lot of times to stop it leaking. But if the spaces were leaking bad, they'd put a filler in it. After a while, the cedar swells, <clears throat> the wood pipe swells, the leaks take up. And this here, if you lost that, that was your job. This is the second canyon in the Capilina Valley where the Cleveland Dam now exists. And this is day one. Uh, the construction company has been taken in. They've made a road down to the base of where the base is going to be poured for the Cleveland Dam. They've set up trailers. You can see their equipment. Okay, this is roughly a year later, and uh, they have got three blocks poured in the very bottom here. Three blocks meaning 30 feet, three blocks at 10 feet. The canyon is all scaled. It is ready now to start bringing in the forms. There was going to be so much concrete used that it would have been out of the question to truck it in. So they put out the biggest cement batch plant they were made. They poured cement, made cement and poured it quicker than the trucks could line up to get it. And they high-lined high it with the carriage and put it down in buckets. 
and they made their lifts. So now it, they'll continue their lifts up until the dam is up to its 302 feet. Now this is, would, would be roughly a year after that. Um, this is the upstream side of Cleveland Dam, in other words, the lake side. The big 70-foot diameter opening in the canyon wall was something that they had to blast day one at 180 degree through the canyon and back out into the river so they could divert the Capilina River the whole time they built the dam. So that's what the, the diversion tunnel was used for. Here is a big old water main. You can see it climbing up the canyon wall and it's going into the rocks. That is coming from the water intake two miles up the valley. They're relying on it to keep water going to the city while they build the dam. Here is the dam and all I'm thinking it's missing is the road bridge. I would imagine all the plumbing is in, done inside. Um, they're almost getting ready to, to face it. It's almost done. And uh, another six months and I believe it was complete. If it isn't preserved, the pictures and the information and the documentation, years from now it's just all going to be lost. And it's too important, it's too valuable. I was just meant to get this and do this. I, I can't explain it any other way other than my own little grandfather working there, mother doing history, passing it on. My, water, my grandfather worked for the water board. I guess I, I've got water in my blood. Capilano Park, you'll find Camp Capilano. It was donated to the Vancouver Parks Board and then transferred to the GVRD in the mid-70s. Today it's available for groups to rent and the GVRD offers a wide range of park interpretive programs. For more information and reservations, you can contact 604-432-6352. Coming up in our Ask an Expert section, Suzanne Hepburn explores how ocean mussels can tell us about the health of our water supply. Hi and welcome to Ask an Expert. Today we're going to answer a question for Paul Wilford of Vancouver, BC. Paul would like to know how they monitor the water quality in the Burrard Inlet. So we went to Paul Van Poppelen, Senior Project Engineer and Biologist with the GVRD, and he asked me to meet him here at the Jericho Sailing Centre. Hi Paul. Hi Suzanne. So what are we doing here? Well, why don't you put this on and come on board and we'll go for a trip. <laughs> Well, Suzanne, what you see happening here is people are putting mussels that we collected locally in these stocks that we then put on the frames. And we have two different types of mussels here, and we have them of different ages. Some of them are the babies, right. the very small ones there, and these are the adults, the larger ones. Okay. And what we do with these frames is these frames that go on our moorings, and you'll see one of those coming up in a minute, and we then place that here in the inlet and it stays there for a number of months. And after a period of time, we bring it back up again. We're looking at what those mussels are like, whether they, uh, whether they fit, whether they've grown, whether they've reproduced. And that tells us an awful lot about what the quality in the water, the water quality in the Burrard Inlet is. Okay, interesting. What is happening here is that we are bringing up some of the frames that we put out last year. And you'll be seeing some of the mussels that have been out there for six months or even longer. You'll see them coming up right now. Okay. We'll be taking these mussels off and we'll have a look at their state of health and their state of growth and the other things I was talking to you about earlier on. We have a number of these stations in the Burrard Inlet. Uh, this one is a short one. It's only about 15 meters. Our deepest is a 70 meter chain wow. with mussels all the way along and down. 
And why do you use muscle specifically? Well, one of the problems, of course, with a lot of these organisms that you've got is they move around an awful lot. If you try and look at fish, which would seem natural in an environment like this, the problem is you can never tell where that fish slept last night. <laughs> so how do you know that whatever you're seeing was picked up or there is a problem in the environment you're looking at right here and today? These muscles, they don't move an awful lot. And once we put them in those socks and in those frames, they don't move at all. So anything that happens to them has to happen here and now. So what are you looking for? Are you looking for toxins or pollution? Oh no. Um, basically what we're looking for really is, is uh, whether the muscles are functioning, whether they are fit. Um, if we would try to look for specific chemicals, there are so many millions of those. You know, where do you start? There's far too much to do. So really, the whole program is based on the idea of environmental health, looking at the health of the environment it is in, and how do you tell that? Well, if there are healthy organisms in this environment, then it tells us something about that environment. So is, is this a new thing? Because I'd always thought they did look for chemicals. It's, it's a very new procedure. Uh, some of the elements have been done before, but we are developing this with, uh, our, in a collaborative effort with Environment Canada, and then specifically with uh, Sylvie Saint-Jean from uh, National Water Research Institute in Burlington. We started this program in um, February 2003, so we're now into our second year. And this is our, the, the beginning of, the, of this year's round. So now that you've got the muscles, how do you tell how they're doing? Well, basically that's what happens back in the laboratory. So what I suggest, why don't you take these with you and give them to Farida in the laboratory and have a look how she deals with these muscles. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Shai is an environmental scientist with the GVRD. Hi, Frida. Hi, Suzanne. Paul asked me to bring these to you. Great, some more muscles. Yeah. We have to measure uh, growth on those, so we're going to weigh those and measure those later. We're going to now dissect a muscle. We're looking for the bisel gap where we can easily put the scalpel in, and then we just run it around the outside of the muscle till we get to the adductor muscle. Oh, and there we go. And ah. now we can see the inside. Right. So what are you looking for when you cut the muscle open? Well, we're looking at uh, another set of growth parameters, uh, just the way the body's growing as well as the reproductive organs, the gonads, the eggs and the sperm. Mm -hmm. So here we can see the gills and if I peel those back, we've got the gonads underneath. Hmm. What do gonads tell you? Well, what we're looking for is just to get an understanding of their re the reproductive effort that the muscles are putting through and how well they're the going to succeed in future generations. So by looking at how, how big the muscles or how hardy the muscle gonad is will be an indication of how well they're going to do in the future. And another thing we do is we look at the blood. So what does the blood tell you? Well, we're looking at uh, the overall quality of the different cells as well as numbers, mm -hmm. and that gives us an idea of the health or fitness of the muscle, and that will hopefully lead us to address whether there's any environmental stresses that they're exposed to. So this is how you test the water quality in the Broad Inlet. Yes, it's one of the ways. It's a new tool we're developing, and we're really excited about it. There's also other tools that we're using to look at water quality. Great. Well, thank you so much for everything, Frida. It's been really interesting. You're welcome. Well, Paul, I know that isn't exactly what I was expecting. How about you? I hope we've answered your question. If you've got a question about our region that you'd like an expert to answer, give us a call at 604-436-6794 or email us at thesustainableregion at gvrd.bc.ca. I'm Suzanne Hepburn. I'll see you next time. As you wend your way up Capilano River, you come to this pipeline bridge. I wonder why they call it that. Well, this is the pipe that runs from the reservoir under First Narrows and through Stanley Park. It supplies water to North Van, West Van, and Little Mountain Reservoir in Vancouver. The health of our environment ultimately depends on the actions of those who live in it. The BC Stream Keepers is a citizen group that works across the province to protect streams, including those that feed into Cap River. Up next, we're going to go on a walk with some of these stream keepers to find out why having bugs in your water can sometimes be a good thing. A creek 
is a moving entity. It's dynamic, it's, it is always changing. This is going to become the Kaplan River. To take care of those small ones makes it that the big one will be healthy when all that water hits it. The Stream Keepers Federation came out in about 1995. We have 3,066 members. We have about 30,000 people out doing the work. Our mission statement is that we assist stream keepers in their task. That we build uh, partnerships, we give support and education. We've been a society now for about three years. Uh, we have about 85 members. We're all volunteers. We do inventories of the creeks. We do rehabilitation of the creeks. Coolgate Creek, which is this creek, is one of the tributaries of the Capilano. And, um, it has a lot of character to it, and it presents uh, a lot of um, features that children can see and, and work with. And, and Collingwood School have a group that are very interested in this creek. I think it's very important to keep our streams clean because, I mean, what about all the critters that live there? You don't, you don't want them to all die out. Okay, you're going to work with Paula? on four of the stream keepers modules. They are going to take a bug sample, they're going to take a water quality sample, they're going to do a storm drain marking, and they're going to put in a couple of plants. Can you feel all that sort of slimy stuff? Yeah, yeah. We use the, uh, the bugs rather than fish in that they're here all the time. They have a life cycle that they're in stream for a year or more. Fish have a tendency to, to move, and there's not as, as many of them. A number of the insects um, are very, very intolerant to any chemicals or any um, thing that pollute the creek. The insects that are in the creek are the life of the fish, and essentially they're also partly the life of the creek. Doing this is really interesting because we actually saw how one can go about looking at all the insects that are in there and so it's really interesting for us because we saw that there are a lot more than we think. Oh, look at the little worm. See the worm? It's really important to have oxygen in the water in that there's things in there that breathe. We're going to do a chemical testing and figure out the dissolved oxygen content within here. The warmer the water, the less oxygen that you have. So let's not wait till it's at the loss stage before we step in. We might be able to do things like get permits and work with fisheries notions to be able to put in um, maybe a little pool cascade. When the water pours over the top, it bubbles and it puts oxygen into the water. The plants next to the creek are part of the environment of the creek and they're very important to create shade, to create insects and all the other things that live in the forest and the vegetation next to the creek. A lot of our urban streams are um, highly impacted by feet. And if there's one thing that people can do easily is to just plant it's within a, a stream area. Well, now we're going to mark uh, some of the storm drain with a fish to show that this is a, a fish-bearing stream. Our storm drain systems go directly from the street to the nearest stream. So anything that you put down or ends up in the storm drain, just keep in mind that would I put that in my home aquarium? By putting little signs on the storm drains, we're telling people, well, be careful of what you leave in the gutters. Be careful of what, when you wash your car, that, that the materials that go into the storm drain are going to go into that creek. We have streamside protection regulations here in British Columbia and we say where's a good place to set that house back from? If it's a salmon bearing stream then you're going to be 30 meters away. If you're going to be uh, in an area that produces food for fish farther down well then you're going to be 15 meters away and if it's one of those little tiny streams then it's only five meters away. When you follow the handbook, there's 14 different modules in there. So anyone can take this information, read it, take the kit, and do it. And if you go through step by step, you'll be able to actually collect information on the stream and know the health of it. 
Well, I've certainly taken a, like, taken a liking to this stream, so I do hope that it has a future. Um, what I've learned today is just the amount of life that this one little stream holds. I think it's gonna run for a while. I think it's just really healthy. Our creek corridors are perhaps one of the things which is a great legacy that we've got. They form a part of the, the greenness of our community and that's uh, something which I think in the North Shore and in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland as a whole, we appreciate. Park, you'll find one of the region's longest running attractions, the privately run Capilano Suspension Bridge. And here you'll find a number of things, including the Story Center, which features some of the original tools used to build the bridge. Originally built in 1889, this is the fourth version of the bridge. The first one was built by George Mackay, who made it out of hemp. I think I like the steel a lot better. Coming up next, Jill Dooling of the GVRD Parks Board gives us an ecological tour of the river. The sound of the water is very tranquil. Just the colors of the water, that emerald green, you don't see that much in and around a city. A river doesn't exist onto itself. It's part of a broader system, and that system includes the forest that surrounds it, the soils, and the streams that feed into the river. There's lots of moss, ferns, and the forest floor is home to many animals. I'm standing at a section of the Capilano River, which is about a kilometer below the dam. This is the section where the waters carve their way through the granite, forming a lovely canyon. The river is home to salmon, trout, and a fish called the prickly sculpin. It's also home to many insects. There's a wide range of amphibians that live in and around the water. There's one amphibian in particular that's quite rare, and it's called the tailed frog. The tailed frog is quite rare because it requires fast flowing and clean streams. This area is also a very popular recreational area. We're standing at a section of the Capilano River, which is about a kilometer north of the estuary. And as you can see behind me, we've got a housing development right up against the edge of the river. With urban development encroaching on this river ecosystem, there are some problems. Right behind me, we've got an example on this section of the river where invasive species are taking over sections of the natural plant community. English ivy will take over an area and it only takes about 15 years for this plant to kill a native tree. It sets acid into the bark of the tree and eventually kills it. Plants like ivy, Himalayan blackberry and the bamboo that's also growing in this area are escapees from people's backyards. What English ivy will do is take over an area and will alter the natural plant community and that will affect eventually the animals that are associated with that plant community. We're standing at the Capilano Estuary. It's a very rich site and a very productive habitat for seabirds. We've got loons, there's grebes, 
Just saw a seal and a bald eagle was sitting on the rocks. This is critical habitat for salmon. It's their rest area for both the adults and the young fish. The adults will wait here for the waters to rise after a heavy rainfall before traveling up to the upper reaches of the Capilano. And the young fish will wait here and adjust to the salt water before they travel out to the ocean. It's a wonderful ecosystem and it's right at the doorsteps of the city. for some stunning views of the river and canyon. If you keep climbing, you end up at Cleveland Dam. A good place to start your hike at Capilano Park is at the midpoint. You can call the GVRD Parks West Area Office at 604-224-5739 for information on park programs and directions. We would also like to hear from you, so if you would like to suggest a story idea or ask an expert a question that's been bugging you, call us at 604-436-6794. Or email us at sustainableregion at gvrd.bc.ca. I'm Colchie Kayla, and I'll see you next time.